In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In his letter to the young church in Rome, the Apostle Paul urges his listeners to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. Doing so, he says, is pleasing to God. It is also their spiritual worship. And by spiritual worship, Paul doesn't mean something mystical or internal, but rather a complete action by the believer in response to God, better translated perhaps as the logical, sensible thing to do. According to one scholar, Paul is saying that offering one's body, one's whole self, is an exploit worthy of thinking beings. Now, before we get to how Paul's words strike our modern ears at a time when presenting our bodies comes with guidelines from the CDC, let's consider what Paul might have been saying to a community of Jewish and Gentile Christians in the middle of the first century. The concept of ritual animal sacrifice is surely resonant here. Observant Jews long made regular pilgrimages to the temple in Jerusalem to sacrifice birds or livestock as an act of worship, obedience, and atonement. Paul's shift from the image of dead animals at the altar to living human bodies isn't just a move from blood and bone to something less messy and more ethereal. Paul is still talking about a physical offering. It's just that now the body is not to be slaughtered, but presented alive to God. The material thing being offered and the worshiper who is doing the offering are now one and the same. And the holistic aspect of such sacrifice harkens back to creation itself. When humankind is molded out of dust and mud and then God blows into its nostrils the breath of life. And the entirety of this created human being, body, spirit, mind, soul, flesh and blood animated with the exhalation of God, the whole thing is what reflects God's image. And the whole thing is what we are expected to present back to God. Paul's words suggest that the Spirit of God at work in our world does its holy work in a particular location, in time and space. And that location is our bodies, the integrated whole of us. It suggests that a fundamental characteristic of our worship is physical. In other words, our worship, at least in part, is a body thing, not limited to what we think or believe or feel, but made pleasing to God in what we do, in our willingness to offer up, to present our deluded, destructive and self-serving actions, our marred and marvelous selves, allowing them to be transformed and renewed to better embody the loving, healing, life-giving spirit of God. But to what end? To what end do we worship? What comes from our making such a God-pleasing offering? Well, the Christian understanding is that this is the way to build the beloved community, a community rich in its diversity and in its gifts, working together to make evident the will and the power of God. So Paul employs the human body itself as a way of envisioning God's beloved community. Bodies are made up of different individual organs and limbs, each with a unique function that nevertheless belong to one another and enhance one another and are united into one whole, capable of doing the will of the one God. So no matter how good I am at what I do, I need to remember that what I do is in service to the whole. 
Individual gifts find their purpose in community when they are used to build others up. And there is a rightness and an exhilaration when this motion of building up occurs, when the gifts God has given us thinking beings are presented back to God for God to put to practical use. And our, our unity, our community becomes so much more than the sum of its parts. So what might all of this mean for us now when we cannot yet present our bodies at this altar in worship? When in-person worship is still weeks away and when our human bodies are at risk the minute we enter public space. Earlier this summer, Christ's Church conducted a parish survey to help us plan for our fall reopening, and we asked you what you missed most about in-person Sunday worship, and the number one response was community. This virus has created a gaping space where our living bodies once gathered in community to pray and sing and become something together that is pleasing to God and worthy of us thinking beings. Now and for a few more weeks, you are watching pre-recorded virtual church, which I imagine is as unsatisfying for you as it is for us. And you may wonder, is what we are doing right now even worship? When our separation from one another and from our sacred space is not only physical, but temporal as well. And I guess that depends. It can be, though it does require a somewhat more elastic or expansive understanding of what it means to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And I think about what the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, wrote about being disciples of Jesus in society. The core values of treating others with fairness and dignity and respect of doing good unto others and loving your neighbor as yourself without regard to your own profit or benefit. These, these are not exclusive to Christianity, but shared by many faith traditions and many secular philosophies. What Christians bring to the table is what Williams calls an extra element. In his book, Being Disciples, he writes, the New Testament describes what happens when human beings are brought into relationship with Jesus Christ by faith as a community in which everyone's gifts are set free for the service of others. The community that most perfectly represents what God wants to see in the human world is one where the resources of each person are offered for every other whether those resources are financial or spiritual or intellectual or administrative. This is the pattern of the body of Christ as St. Paul defines it. Williams writes, it is not only that the least or apparently most useless has the dignity of possessing a gift and a purpose, it's also that everyone is able to give to others, to have the dignity of being a giver, being important to someone else. And instead of being a static picture of just everyone having dignity, the Christian vision is dynamic. Everyone is engaged in building up everyone else's human life and dignity. These are the words of Rowan Williams. And the, the extra element set forth in his words gives us the answer we seek about what worship is and can be right now. The sense of loss we have is so acute. And we have a new appreciation for the critical needs surrounding us, for healing and for hope, for, for food and funding, for compassion and cheerfulness, for trusted tradition, and imaginative innovation. 
Our church, Christ's church, needs you, her individual members, to pull harder in our quest to build up God's beloved community. On September 13th, Christ's church will resume in-person worship and at long last, some of us will again present our bodies as a living sacrifice at this altar in real time and space. Others of us, for whatever reason, will not feel comfortable enough to return just yet. Either way, our experience of community will be different, but the urging of St. Paul to be actively involved by faith in Jesus in becoming important to someone else, that remains the same. As we continue this fast knot of our own choosing, of physical separation from one another, we can still worship. We can offer our whole selves, gifted and alive, and ask God to transform us into active agents of reverent change for God's beloved community. No matter where we are physically right now, we are still the works of God's hand. And we can live the words of Psalm 138, which we read today. We can live these words in our bodies as we bow down toward God's holy temple and praise God's name, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice so that in the midst of trouble, God will make good his purposes for us. Amen.